power. It's the ability to direct or influence the behavior of others or the course of events. Today we're asking the question, why do I feel so powerless? Let's jump right in. Throughout history, the Jews, or God's people, awaited the arrival of a Messiah, a rescuer who would end their suffering and their oppression, a king who would establish the nation of Israel as the preeminent kingdom to lead the world. And as an oppressed people, they longed for the day that their Messiah would arrive. Enter Jesus. And during Jesus' three-year public ministry, his followers began to see him as the Messiah, which he was and is. However, their idea of what it meant to be the Messiah and God's plan for the Messiah did not line up. Who they expected to be is not a lot unlike the character portrayed by Mel Gibson in a clip from Braveheart. I just envision... uh, you know, him rallying the troops, right? Like we're getting ready to go and fight and just pumping up the people. That is who and what the followers of Jesus expected him to be like. And with that background in mind, let's look at what happens when Jesus is arrested. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now, with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? he asked. Jesus, the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more, he asked them, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus, the Nazarene. I told you I am he, Jesus said. And since I'm the one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. Now, I can almost hear Peter shouting, Viva la Revolution, as he slices off that guy's ear. I mean, can you imagine it? Here it is, finally, the end to their oppression. At last, they will rule the nations. Peter lets out a metaphorical battle cry, and how does Jesus respond? Let's look at the very next verse. But Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? Peter, put down your sword. What? Disillusionment, disappointment, disbelief. Peter knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He knew he was the Son of God, and he knew he was powerful. And Peter had a very specific idea in mind of what that power looked like. But he was wrong. Jesus shows us that true power doesn't come by force or might, but by pursuing God's will above your own. Jesus didn't want to suffer. He wasn't looking forward to being tortured. Just hours before his arrest, he says this to his friends. He told them, my soul is crushed to grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground praying, my father, If it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus, being just as human, as flesh and blood and feeling as you and I are, did not want to suffer and die the way that he did. But more than that, he desired to be faithful and obedient to God. And so he surrendered his will 
and submitted to God's. What was the result? Did he suffer? Yes. Was he tortured? Yes. Humiliated? Mocked? Yes. Betrayed and deserted? Yes. Did he die? Yes. But then, God performed the greatest miracle of all. After three days of death, God raised Jesus to life, defeating the power of death and sin and evil over every person in human history. How did we define power? The ability to direct or influence behavior of others or the course of events. No single action has ever had a greater impact in the history of the world than that. You see, real power comes through our submission to God. Our greatest source of power is found when we utterly surrender to God's will because God is power. He is the almighty, the all-powerful. And when we work with him and not against him, we see real power in action. But I will admit, it is often in ways that differ than we might expect. And like Peter, we may be shocked in how God's will unfolds. But we must continue to trust that God is at work and will work things out for our good. Surely, in the moment of Christ's death, it seemed all hope was lost. God had lied and God had died. And time passed. One day, two days, three days later, then a miracle happened. Don't give up on the power of God before the miracle happens. Open your heart and your mind to accept the fact that the miracle you're waiting on may be different than what you want. And the timing may take a lot longer than what you think it should. Prayers for healing may result in the body's ultimate and complete healing that comes when we enter into God's eternal glory. This side of heaven, death feels like a tragedy. But rest assured that death is just a stepping stone from one life to the next for followers of Jesus. The Bible teaches us that since Jesus overcame the power of the grave, we as Jesus followers should no longer fear death. Jesus was the Messiah that Peter proclaimed him to be. It's just that the Messiah looked differently than what Peter thought he would. The kingdom he established was not of this world. It was so much more than what Peter had in mind. And everything unfolded just as scriptures foretold. It was just in a different way than what people were expecting. We want power. But we want it so that we can accomplish our own agenda. Oftentimes the power we seek isn't power at all, but an illusion of power. I think about uh, a specific scene from the TV show, The Big Bang Theory. Now in this episode, Professor Proton comes over uh, to the guy's apartment and they're asking him to do various experiments. And Sheldon asks, do the potato clock, do the potato clock. And Penny, not being as science-y as the other guys, says, well, what's the potato clock? And Professor Proton explains that he can power a clock with a potato. She is floored. She's like, you can do that? She's like, wouldn't that end the world energy crisis? <laughs> to which the professor says, no. A potato powered clock. If you've seen this experiment done for all intents and purposes, it looks like the potato is powering that clock. And I'd be lying if I said I understood how that experiment worked without Googling it. Um, so basically, the potato will act as a conduit to power the clock, but only for a short time. It's not an authentic power source. So although it will work, it's short-lived. And further, it can only power small things like a clock or a single LED light bulb. 
it can't power your house, or as Penny suggested, end the energy crisis, because it isn't true power. Sometimes we chase after illusions of power, potatoes, if you will, to power our lives. We think, as we think of power as brute force or might, and we try to accomplish our will by physical intimidation, scaring people into doing what we want. We think of power as money. Take the lyrics from Destiny's Child, once a very popular song, Independent Woman. The shoes on my feet, I bought them. The clothes I'm wearing, I bought them. The rock I'm rocking, I bought it, because I depend on me if I want it. We wrongly think that financial independence, money, and wealth are an adequate power source, and we use our financial means to exert our will. Still others think of fame or celebrity status is the ultimate power source. People like this say things like, don't you know who I am? Don't you know who my father is? And they try to get what they want based on who they think they are or who others perceive them to be. And there are many other potatoes or false deceptive power sources out there. I wonder what yours have been. You might even write it down in your notes today. Political power, independence, looks, physical health, emotional manipulation, the list goes on. And these things aren't all bad, not at all. But they aren't a true and authentic source of power because all power comes from God. Nothing is given that he can't take away, should he so desire. All things come from him. And if he is not your source, then you simply got a really fancy potato clock running your life. The Bible says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What are all these other things the Bible verse is referring to? Well, Jesus is telling his followers not to worry about physical needs like their clothes or food, etc. And now what I, I used to think this meant was that as long as I sought God, meaning I went to church, I prayed, yada, 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 whatever, God was going to give me everything I wanted or at least everything I thought I needed. That is not what this passage of scripture is communicating. It is telling us to seek God first and foremost. Concern ourselves with the things that concern God. Don't worry about these other things that seem really important to us. Seek God's kingdom, God's purpose, God's will. Nothing is more important or even of equal importance than that. Not the shoes on your feet, the food you'll eat, or where you'll sleep. All these things are minor details in the grand scheme of eternity. Now you might think, well, I need those to live. And yeah, that's true. And if it's God's will for you to live, then you will. And he will provide. So why worry yourself with it? Seek him and his will first. All these other things will be given to you. And if they aren't, if you perish, then death is just a stepping stone into eternity. It is not the end, and it's not something to be feared. Peter wanted God's kingdom to come, but he misunderstood what that would look like. And because he didn't understand, he experienced shock, grief, disillusionment. And after Jesus was raised to life and revealed himself to Peter, he finally understood what being Messiah was really about. And he was all in. Peter decided to give up on his dreams of an earthly kingdom, ruling over others, and instead devoted himself wholeheartedly to pursuing the will of God. What was the result? Well, he died. Brutally. He, like Jesus, was crucified. But before that, what happened in between Jesus' resurrection and Peter's death was astonishing. 
in the book of Acts, we read some of Jesus' last word to his disciples. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Peter and other Jesus followers were gathered together when the Holy Spirit came to dwell among them. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This amazing thing happens that's hard to put into words. And onlookers, people passing by where the disciples were, overheard them and assumed they were drunk. But Peter begins to preach, teach, or testify, however you want to say it. He tells the people about Jesus, who he is. Yes, he had been killed, but God had brought him back to life, and he lives. That they should turn away from the shameful things that they do and to follow God. And people were saved by the thousands. Peter, pursuing God's will, filled with the power that comes from God's Holy Spirit that lives in all of us that choose to submit to God and proclaim that Jesus is Lord, is instrumentally used by God to change the course of history. Thousands and thousands of people come to life-changing, life-saving faith in God through Jesus because of Peter's obedience and surrender to God's will. And history is changed. Life is altered. Peter has tapped into the ultimate, true, authentic power source of life. Will you? Will you set aside your own agenda it may be a good agenda. The, the desires we have aren't all wrong. But will we seek God wholeheartedly? Will we accept and pursue God's will for our life? Even if it means our suffering. Even if it means putting others before ourselves. Even if it means accepting we are powerless on our own, completely dependent upon God. The result may not be the life or the outcome you originally had in mind. But I think if we could ask Peter, it is a life far better than he could ever dreamt of, suffering and all. And on the other side of eternity, there are no regrets. Will you surrender to God? Will you lay down your own desires and follow him no matter what? No matter the cost, no matter what he asks, no matter what people say or even think. We are called children of God, and we are told to be obedient to God's ways and live our lives the Jesus way, which is a way of surrender, a life of service to others, a life committed to telling others about God, your neighbors, your co-workers, your family members, the in-laws, and yeah, even the outlaws, they need to hear about Jesus. So be bold. Be filled with the power that comes from God's Holy Spirit that he pours out freely to those who pursue him. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Uh, this message today, this teaching, turned out a lot different than what I originally had in mind. But I do believe it's the message that God wants me to deliver. The power we seek is not often the power we need. We need God's power. But that power is found not in conforming the world to our will, but by conforming our will to God's. Today's question in our Why series was, Why do I feel so powerless? Well, because you are. We all are, and you might not like that. That's okay. If I'm being honest, I don't really like that. But when we accept when we are powerless, or that we are powerless, it allows us to go to the one who is powerful. Will you pray with me?
God, right now we acknowledge that you are the Almighty. You are all-powerful. And God, we desire to have that power in our lives. Help us to surrender our will to yours. Help us to lay down the things that we desperately want, that we think are right. And God, rather than pursuing those things, even if they're good things, God, let us pursue you more than anything. And if it be your will, God, we pray that you would add those other things to our lives. But God, I just pray that each and every one of us would surrender our lives right now to you, acknowledging it is your power and your will that is far greater than anything else. Teach us to be wholly dependent upon you. Let us live lives that honor you, that work for you and not against you. God, let us stop viewing death as a tragedy, but as a stepping stone into eternity, a beautiful and wonderful place that we get to be with you forever. Give us boldness as we share your love. Give us boldness as we live our lives being beacons of light in this dark and lonely world. God, we pray you lead us and you guide us and we surrender all things to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for watching. I hope today's message was meaningful and we'd love to partner with you on your spiritual journey. If there are things that we can pray with you about or if you would like to get connected into one of our journey groups so that you can be growing in your faith, would you reach out to us? You can fill out our eConnect card. Uh, a link is in the description of this video. It's on our website, journeyconnection.com. You can text us, you can call us, you can email us. All of that info is in the description. We would love to partner with you on your spiritual journey. And if you would like, um, please give to support the life-changing ministry of Journey Church. We want to further God's kingdom here on earth. And so you can do that on our website, journeyconnection.com. Just go to the Give tab. And when you do, not only do you support the mission of Journey Church, but also our community partners, one of which is the Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity builds homes for people right here in our local community. They are doing excellent work. And when you give to us, part of that giving goes to our mission partners. Thank you so much. I hope you'll share this video with others.